Okay, so we'll get started. Uh, this is our first ever industry perspective panel. If you guys like it, we'll, we'll do it. We'll, uh, we'll keep it as a format. Uh, our theme this time is uh, network operations. We have three very different uh, types of operators. Uh, the model is going to be the panelists will present anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes about their architecture. It doesn't have to be necessarily Linux, but we'd like to know why they don't use Linux. And that will be followed by the two panel chairs, uh, Rupa and Somini, who are going to ask uh, hard questions, maybe not. You, they'll take it easy on them because this is the first time. And uh, then it's open to the audience to ask any questions. Okay, thanks. So with that, uh, and please introduce yourselves. Hi. I'm Vikram Sivaj. Uh, I'm the product manager in Mobile Ajax. Uh, hi, my name is Arthur. I, I work as a software engineer at LinkedIn. Uh, I'm, I'm replacing for Sean, who had last minute business activity and had to cancel last minute. Hello, my name is Marek. Uh, I work at Cloudflare. Uh, and I'm an engineer with my uh, m biggest expertise in DDoS mitigations. All right, um, so maybe this this might be interesting to you guys. Maybe we'll come out of um, Linux kernel a little bit and see how people are using stuff and what real life challenges we are trying to solve. Um, so we are just a young startup in Silicon Valley. Uh, we were funded by Dosh Telecom. Um, and basically our use case is that we're gonna aggregate operators across the world and we'll provide that infrastructure for people like Niantic or game applications to come and run. And why is it important? I think the way we look at this market right now is emerging. Um, latency is becoming important. Um, people um, are seeing the need to run applications closer to edge. Now, edge, edge boundaries are still debatable. People still believe that some of the edge will be actually on the device, on the cars, in the planes. And, but we, we strongly believe the networks will have some say in how edge develops in the near future. Um, but first cases we want to tackle is the AR um, and machine learning stuff. Um, why now? Because we see operators have made billion dollar investments in virtualizing their infrastructure. We could actually convert them to internet-like structure. Um, who are customers? Basically, whoever wants to run an application on the edge. Um, and the device makers. So this is uh, from the recent study uh, we did. Essentially, if you look at it, a uh, lot of cloud service providers are pumping money into cloud. And it's actually a lot of money. $300 billion have gone in the last 10 years. But then equally amount of, actually way more amount of money has gone into building the mobile networks to support the sustained data rate. So in last 10 years, it's like $1.7 trillion. Um, and it's actually, the more, the movement we are seeing right now across operators is that they want to virtualize their infrastructure. So a lot of these assets are still running uh, without any applications. Um, they are still oversubscribed, overbuilt, um, because that was the traditional way how operators used to build it. And we are seeing a huge increase in IoT devices. Um, Phones, cars, drones, everything in your home, everything is getting connected. So there is a steady state increase in data consumption, and um, um, networks in between are just a byte pipe as of today. Their model is just to connect you to internet. This is what typically happens when uh, you consume data. Um, it runs through a mobile networks, and the way it is organized is uh, pretty painful, but essentially it's a collection of boxes then it goes to cloud and comes back. So if you're lucky, you probably have a 40 millisecond delay there, um, or it could be worse, depending on where you are. But nothing is dynamic, nothing is closer to edge. We can't figure out where to go. Most of the times your sessions will be anchored on some gateway and then you'll be routed back, even if there's a edge cache uh, by a cloud service provider. So it's, it's uh, something which is the problem we want to solve. 
So what, did we, what we are trying to do is essentially, if you look at it, if I can show this, these are the new cloudlets which are emerging in the operators' um, uh, infrastructure. And these are um, the configurations which we see typically are not like massive cloud services based on which site we are going to, if it's a zip code level, it could be like some bunch of racks sitting there. Um, we broke the model of bringing devices um, by having a standard SDK and also being part of subscribe, device makers enablement layers. And then we also provided the cl standard cloud consumption model to people like Niantic or some other application companies to come and onboard us. Um, so these are some of the key features we actually have, and I'll show you how it actually works. But some of the cases which we are looking at, and one of one of few of the cases we are solving right now are for mobile gaming and uh, augmented reality games. Um, but as in, um, the data thinning problem is like, I have lots of data coming out of IoT devices. These are like short packets. People, um, these machines just send it across. It's very expensive to run it over the operator's network. You could actually aggregate them and send a combined report back to the cloud. So that's a data thinning problem uh, which we want to solve. Uh, there's a bunch of things like drone swarming. Um, of course, there's IoT. There are a lot of players in IoT who want to solve um, uh, you know, localized IoT spaces like in an industrial setting, um, how machines will communicate to each other. But they don't really necessarily need to go to an operator ecosystem. They can run their network there. Um, so yeah, these are some of the applications we are looking at and some of them are deployed. Um, but let me dive into what, how does it work. Um, so somebody um, like a game company will come and actually embed the SDK uh, in their application. This could be glasses, this could be um, uh, devices. And um, what we'll look at is um, if the edge is the application is offloaded to the edge, um, then we have something called a matching engine, uh, which is, let me see if I can point that here, which will actually look at the, your GPS coordinates coming out and point you to the nearest edge. Um, and then we have sophisticated mechanisms to increase the, the cluster size, reduce it based on the stress. It is very likely that if some site is collapsing, then we might actually route you to a better site. Um, the default route is always go back to the cloud, but there is this layers of uh, cloudlets within the operator ecosystem that if you miss the zip code, you can go to regional level and then to the cloud. Um, by the way, a lot of latencies across this entire chain, if I look at it, um, can be saved by doing what we are doing. But then there's RAN part two, so we will talk about it a little bit later, uh, how we see it, it's evolving. But yeah, it's actually something which is deployed in Dosh Telecom. So this is how typically these things work. Um, we use Cloudflare, so and that's, um, I, I have a co-panelist now, so I can attest to that. So, but essentially, yeah, the, when you actually try to access uh, some URI like Dosh Telecom, um, Next.net, it's going to resolve uh, and give you a public IP. Uh, this public IP will be isolated into a particular DME, which will be running in a particular city. So this is the actual cloudlet and bond, which actually gets this, um, and all the HTTP requests are offloaded. Um, the similar mechanisms exist across different operators like Telefonica and Barcelona. Okay, so this is the stack which is deployed today. Um, nothing more exciting about it, but this is how we see uh, typically when we engage with the operator, how they have layered, layered their infrastructure. We see OpenStack as a common, common preference across the board. Um, it's not necessary that we have to run over much machines, but we could, we just collect this inventory, uh, we figure out how much inventory they have, and we run the workload on it. Um, we're we'll, uh, we working on um, some of the partners to actually enable bare metals, um, uh, which will be, uh, I think which will be more resource effective for us. Um, and these are our components. So essentially what happens is when you onboard us, today we just and make it really simple. We, we, people are used to cloud environment, and Kubernetes is some, one of the favorite orchestration schemes they have. So uh, we spawn a cluster. 
uh, for a particular client. Um, and the, uh, you, you learned about the DME, which is the stateless um, uh, matching engine, which actually points to the uh, edge side, and the, the content will be served out of edge. Um, the CRM is the, the smart guy who's actually figuring out how much to skip people where. Um, and there are some, some of the things which, uh, by nature of running within an operator, you get free. Like uh, there's a cellular control plane, we can actually verify that entity. We can figure out uh, where you are, um, just based on how which tower you're connected to. And then we have specific controller policies which run across countries, uh, which we uh, enforce. Let's say if it's Europe, then there are some GDPR regulations. We cannot. Um, yeah, there are a bunch of stuff which we could, uh, which we don't allow to share. Or, um, but yeah, these. Mobile Edge controllers which are sitting on the public cloud are a mechanism for you to choose where you want to go in the world. Um, so typically how um, location works is that you connect to the mobile network. Um, we register the client. Um, we actually verify the identity. Uh, then DMA also does the location verification and we actually validate it. Um, if there is an event where, and this is, was the, this was the driver for people like Niantic who, who were losing money because people were actually spoofing locations um, to tune out some 10, 12 million dollars. So the, this allows them to actually um, protect themselves by using this location information from the operator. So in case if, it's a, uh, if you actually, spoof the location, and if you're not in that zone, in that cellular tower, nearby that cellular tower, they'll actually respond that that's not where you are. So yeah, it helps. Um, and then what we have done typically is that um, when we see um, in the operator zones, some of the, um, the, the same technologies which are being used in cloud, um, we are porting today on the cloudlet. That doesn't mean the the future landscape will look, look, like, look like the same. I, I think the way cloud service providers do the business is based on um, charging you for a certain CPU, um, IO storage. The idea is that uh, it's more usable, not performance oriented. Our form factors are a little different. We cannot have massive data center in Midwest uh, to run this at cost. Um, we actually look at a lot of performance things and improvements we want to do across these frameworks. Um, but quite simply, I think what is happening is that the farm factor, even the clients are bringing their applications in, it's pretty lightweight. Um, and they selectively choose the workload they want to bring to Edge. Um, and this is what we see, that people have a bunch of microservices running in the cloud, and they'll bring certain things which they want to offload. And we conveniently offload them and give them the latency characteristics they need. So quite pretty simple there. So the big question I think the, the panel um, was asking is why, why should we invest in Linux? And um, the, the model we are seeing which is emerging in the industry today is essentially you look across all cloud service providers, they are actually building their edge strategy. Um, they're putting their caches near regions, and it's gonna naturally be an environment like when you go into 5G, people will have network slices, they'll buy those slices from the operators and they're gonna put that um, near zip codes or near regions. But the business model is basically based on taking that workload and offloading to the backend, which is the, the cloud, because that's the only way the clouds could actually service that kind of traffic and optimally. A lot of investment has been there. What our view of looking at this problem is that if you look at specific sets of workloads, um, we want to serve them at the real edge. We don't want to take these transactions off uh, to the cloud. And um, that's what we see, because if, if you're playing an AR game and um, the latency is more than 25 milliseconds, you might actually have a headache playing that game. So these are, these are interesting models because Although gaming industry might not look like mission critical, but the characteristics which we see on a game is pretty much same how we will see autonomous vehicles, uh, other industries developing, which will have similar demands. 
So what, what is our goal here? I think what we are looking at is not um, how the edge caches are being developed today by peering, but we are actually looking at a way to distribute these applications across the world um, so that you know, there's, the, there are, the edge workloads are optimally um, executed, and also there's paths for everybody to go um, where they want to go to zip code level, they want to go to region level, they want to go to the cloud. That, that sort of distributed nature of this network um, will allow it to scale um, across the operators. So it doesn't have to be that just because you're not, let's say, Verizon subscriber, you won't get access to the service. Um, you probably will get benefits of it. Um, so where do we see really value in, in Linux? I think for us, the driver is that there has to be programmability uh, inbuilt. Uh, programmability inbuilt in how packets move in our fabric, programmable into programming the end devices. We are very interested in accelerations. Um, we don't see people, um, at least the infrastructure providers, having or buying smart NICs or um, using more sophisticated chips. What we do see is generic hardware, racks and racks of those lying there. Um, so running high performance stuff on a commodity hardware is our drive. Um, we have a bigger problem, which is mobility, um, because the way the sessions are anchored today, they are getting routed through a P gateway. Um, generally, the way it used to work was ideally the people were just connecting to internet, so that's how they layered their network, the mobile uh, operators. But now, as we are moving towards the edge, that scheme of anchored networks will not work. Um, so there was a talk, I think, about ILNP. So that's a good effort, but I think from a research point to actually a demo to a production, it takes time. But we are seriously looking at if we could solve mobility problems up front. Um, then there are other aspects of um, traffic slicing for certain types of traffic so that we have better control on which packet should land on which application and what should be the, the path to it. <laughs> And the embedded security. I think it's becoming more and more clear. Um, we you rarely see um, mobile networks getting hacked, but you do see often attacks on cloud. Um, the internet is um, exposed in that manner, maybe because of the nature that it is so popular. But I think embedded security within the devices, within the OS layers, is what we are looking to achieve, um, hopefully, with these things. Okay, so programmability, as we look at it, is across the virtualization infrastructure, what we see, it's a common denominator. Um, we, we look at this problem as saying, okay, can we um, program a host the same way I want to program a container or maybe a switch? The form factor of switch and server is not much different today. I mean, if I could basically take a generic server and convert it into a switch. Uh, I have all the software features in the kernel to actually make it happen. But yeah, ASICs will serve a purpose for me, so I'll use that whenever I have that availability in the inventory. So based on these combinations of applications, so do I need to accelerate something? Do I need to uh, do something in an ASIC? That programmability should be inbuilt in this model. Um, today, I, I haven't seen that. Um, may, there are a bunch of people who are solving this problem on the SDN space, but I, I think a uniform way to program these things is what we, we look for. And we'll make some movements in this area as we go along. Uh, we'll contribute back to the community. But that's what our view of programmability would be. And uh, we definitely see that we need to improve the mobility problem. Because as the networks are evolving, right now the, the range for a handoff is like five miles. Um, as we go into 5G, it'll be 0.5 miles. So rapid handoffs happening. And so you see the degradation and um, the general protocols which will work um, on LTE will start failing. So we need a way that it should be stateless, it should be efficient, it should be resilient to attacks, um, and it should be uh, scalable to billions of devices, and that's what the market is evolving to be. Uh, this is just a standard programmable pipeline which we generally want to energize. Um, so we do see value in doing stuff like, okay, can I actually do load balancing on top of rack switch? 
And if I have to do it, how do I go about it? Um, we also see value in not running Kubernetes natively because the packets are just running across the fabric from a cube router to an overlay to a container. We want to hit a container uh, right, right away from a tar and get the response back. Our idea is not to overwhelm our fabric with lots of packets running around in a microservice model. So if you look at it, it's actually going in the opposite direction. People move to microservices model, and now we are actually trying to bring them back to say, can we run, uh, it's okay to run stateful application, but can we run like lightweight containers? And we could hit your containers and get you the latency demands you have instead of wasting my fabric capacity. So a bunch of these things are evolving. Um, this is our view of how our pipeline should look like. Um, should be controlled centrally. We should be able to locate resources. We should be able to find inventories of devices. We should be knowing um, where to host a particular workload. Um, that will allow us to uh, move into the, the real edge uh, latency sensitive environments. This is one other effort which we think is critical because um, when I often talk to mobile network operators, they say, well, okay, I will, you'll solve my problem from millisecond to microsecond, or uh, you'll speed the packets. But the real problem is on the RAN side, which is actually the consumption, where we're the actual latency. Um, and there are some efforts, I think I haven't seen something really credible, but that's nothing to relate to uh, Linux. But what I want to emphasize is that unless we solve the end-to-end -end latency problem, um, you won't have the next generation of internet, what we want to actually build. Um, so we're going to be working with certain people to actually make these things uh, real, um, so to con control the RAN side scheduling. Um, yeah, but this is, this is our way of looking at this problem. This is um, programmable slices. Any questions? Or we can wait for the, yeah, OK. All right, so Arthur, I think you're next. Yeah. Okay, works. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, I want to apologize first as, uh, as a result of this late uh, last second cancellation, I had almost no time to, to prepare the fancy, fancy slides uh, others have. So these are more of a talking points that um, I'm going to, to touch. And also at the same time, um, I'm planning to talk more uh, about the data center perspective from the perspective of a large content provider and slightly more uh, on a his system level and, and a little bit about the, uh, the potential operational challenges we we have uh, we had and and we still have. Um, so first of all, to, to build the context to, to slightly understand the, the size of the problem that we are dealing with. So uh, as of now, uh, LinkedIn has roughly 250k of machines, uh, he bare metal his servers. Uh, we are um, with with the network or with our servers in about 20 locations globally, and we peer with roughly 4,000 of uh, of the networks. Um, so, the his size of uh, of the network is uh, is one thing. So let's say it would be easy to uh, to eventually build the network, but we still need to play the catch up game. So once, once we get to the, uh, the size of the infrastructure we had a month or a quarter ago, the demands are uh, bigger and bigger. So uh, we roughly have uh, 30, 35% of, of growth every year. And uh, the demands from the bandwidth, they, they mostly come from the demands uh, from the compute. So uh, as the days of the, the Moore's law, they are effectively over. So we expect this to grow even faster and faster as to tackle bigger problems uh, from the application perspective. We will expect to see more and more communications uh, between the, the machines and our, uh, our network needs to handle that. So um, the, the organic growth is one thing. So it's, 
you pretty easy having the, the right models to, uh, to forecast the, the capacity. The, the real problems are with, uh, with the inorganic growth, as it's very challenging to get it right at the scale of multiple or hundreds of applications we run. So uh, even a single update key to the application might, might cause a, a big key traffic spikes. Um, and while, uh, while here from the edge perspective, um, every single byte sent, uh, sent to us, it causes ex explosion internally in the east-west east traffic. So we roughly estimate that the, every single byte sent to us will cause a thousand of bytes sent within the fabric. So uh, it includes things like the call graph for the, the main LinkedIn application or, uh, or the website, uh, the, the Kafka we, we use for all the, all the logging and accounting things, uh, and offline analysis and, and dealing with things like, like machine learning uh, in the heat training phase. But um, as, as we now have 2019, I guess, uh, we, we haven't always been in, in that uh, slightly more comfortable situation that we are right now. Um, uh, over, over the years, starting from, uh, from year roughly 2010, we had different main challenges or different priorities where to invest our resources. So. Um, first of all, around the, around year 2010, uh, our main uh, main job was to keep the site up, as uh, the the site, the size of the infrastructure, size of the network, it was growing very rapidly, and at that time, uh, it was growing faster than we had exp experience with, uh, both at the organizational level and and the tooling level. Um, so once this, uh, this thing was solved and we kind of got uh, from this operational overload and, and we could spend some more time on, on the design of things to, to make sure it, it doesn't happen again, um, we experienced even bigger growth. Um, so uh, then we, we saw the, the limits of the, the current network design. Um, as the, the key services, the, key, the applications, they, they wanted to scale, uh, scale faster and faster, and uh, we had to come up with a way to be able to deliver that capacity. Um, so eventually, um, once, uh, once we designed the, uh, the new architecture of, of our key data centers, we had to focus on innovation for the hyperscale, as, uh, as we call it. So, um, the unlimited bandwidth is uh, his slide, uh, uh, clickbait here, uh, as obviously no, we cannot talk about the unlimited bandwidth, but okay, sometimes from the perspective of low bandwidth uh, application uh, working in a, in a data center with a lot of bandwidth, we can uh, provide that kind of illusion or uh, abstraction layer. Um, okay, then at the hyperscale, we also need compute for demand as uh, we see spikes uh, in, in the usage. So uh, it's, it's easy to provide that, that compute and for the network to, to be able to, to handle this. So, um, and, and then the important stuff is that the data center as a whole it should be programmable. So once we build the, the hardware, once we build the infrastructure, we don't want to deal with the, uh, the physical stuff anymore. We want to change as much as we can with the software and pretty much as, uh, as quick as we can. Um, and all these things are easy, uh, assuming you, uh, you have unlimited amount of cash. But um, being able to, to scale the cost effectively and not even scale the cost, but scale, scale the, the number of people we had as people scale here terribly. Um, that, that, that was the, the biggest challenge to, to make sure that the, our growth is, uh, is efficient in, uh, in a very broad term. So it, he brought us to the concept of, of owning, owning the code. And it's, it's like also the, the answer to 
the, the question why, why we use Linux. The high-level phrase is that uh, it enables us to control our own destiny, but what it means in, uh, in real life. So actually to me, it, it means that uh, we can get much higher velocity owning, owning the software. So um, with, with higher velocity, you know, we can roll out the, the new software version every, every day or every week, uh, basically as soon, uh, as soon as we want. It enables us to experiment. So for example, if the experiment fails, we can immediately roll back and, uh, and continue working as we, as we worked before. So the, the same thing applies to the, the bug fixes and the innovation is much easier as, we, for example, we want to, to change some element of, of the system. We, we don't have to wait for a vendor 12 or 18 months uh, to, uh, to make this happen as uh, Mm, having a lag of, uh, of that many months and you're trying to play the catch-up game with, uh, uh, with the, our infrastructure growth, it, it just it doesn't, doesn't fit well. Uh, and a few words here uh, about our data center design. We use a, a five-stage uh, five clause or spine and leaf. Uh, our control plane protocol is, uh, is BGP here. You ask why BGP? Uh, at that time, that was the only uh, only solution uh, that we could use, taking into account all the all the constraints we had, um, and the uh, data center is a, a single SKU. So, uh, as a um, basic building block, we uh, we use one hardware box that is replicated in uh, in all the roles, spine, leaf, and uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, the um, it's very important to talk about the design principles we had in mind when, uh, when designing the data centers. So the simplicity to me is, is the key, as uh, humans uh, in general are, are terrible at keeping the state of the network in mind at a large scale, and it, it leads to outages. So um, um, making sure that we have very few exceptions and, and the infrastructure is very simple. Plus, um, engaging software to, to make sure that at least part of the state could be kept in software, uh, to me, it's, it's very important. Uh, at the same time, we wanted to use open standards or open tools when possible, obviously. Uh, it was not always, always possible. Um, Okay, from the business continuity perspective as well, uh, being independent, so not really tied to any single vendor or, uh, or even in, in terms of uh, I know ODP, any single supplier, uh, was also an important thing. And I, I mentioned the programmability bit before, so we just uh, don't want to deal with, the, uh, with changing the physical data center anymore. We want to model this in, in software and, and change this in software. Um, so, as I mentioned, his single, his Q, uh, nice, nice picture, how you can visualize it. So, uh, every rack has a he top of the rack is switched with 100 gigs uplinks, access links. Um, <coughs> The, uh, the the top of the rack he switches they he, they connect to the aggregation he switches or core, which uh, eventually connect to to a fabric. Um, so going down um, this path, uh, we uh, we can minimize the latency or, or the num number of chips that every every packet he needs to he travel over the network. In, in terms of the he building block. Um, uh, the data centers, the, the new data center design uh, uses one he switch, uh, ODM, so we decided to no longer use uh, big he chassis he switches at the expense of having more control planes and management planes to manage. Uh, and also what's important as we are not a vendor and we he tried to keep uh, the architecture simple. Uh, we use a very tiny, tiny set of simple features, so no fiber channel, no uh, VXLAN, no EVPN, or, uh, or, or things similar. So, um, 
Okay, so here, uh, after spending some time on, uh, on analyzing and exploring, we ended up using Hisonic. So uh, Hisonic is a network operating system based on Linux. Um, and um, it was good enough. Uh, it was good enough for, uh, for our use case. Um, uh, as we effectively needed only very basic IPv4 and IPv6 routing, uh, we had to have the BGP and we wanted to have an option to, to modify it. As, uh, as personally, uh, I, I think that the, the key thing to running the network with high availability and high user satisfaction is mostly in the management plane, not in the data plane or, or control plane. Assuming that the control plane is done roughly, roughly right. Um, the same thing here uh, about the, the flat networks. We don't want to build any form of overlay networks, uh, no middle boxes. If, uh, if applications want to build some form of uh, overlays, it's fine, but the, the network does not provide that, that kind of service. Um, so he's, he's super, he's super quickly about his self-healing. Um, uh, his his self-healing is a uh, very, uh, very good use case for, uh, he, for example, things like his TCP uh, analytics. So he gathering data and then acting on, on the data. Um, so uh, he, first of all, um, he, from the Hisonic perspective, we he push all the all the he data we have uh, to to Kafka, uh, and then uh, and then the Kafka. Uh, so on the Hisonic switches, we have a Kafka agent. Eventually, it gets to the the Kafka he broker, when we, uh, where we can uh, use the data both for the online and offline analysis. So he thinks like alerting. The, cor the correlation logging for the, the uh, analysis uh, in the future. Um, so for the, the, the first step in any, any form of uh, self healing is to make sure that we can detect and isolate the, the fault in the network. So we have an active probing tool that uh, is installed on every, every host and, and send active probes. Uh, he sends data to, to Kafka pipeline, and uh, it, it's used for, for pinpointing the, uh, uh, the errors in the network. At, uh, at the same time, we use this for things like uh, SLO measurements, alerting, or displaying heat map. Um, and, and the key final, uh, key final step in the self-healing phase is how to fix the, the problem or how to remediate them. Um, so vast majority of the alerts we have, I know, a broken power supply. These are super simple and, and super easy to fix. And uh, actually, the on-call engineer uh, does not have to be involved. So uh, we use a workflow engine that uh, we build some rules, and and it simply files a, a ticket to the the technician that will eventually replace the, um, the, the, the faulty hardware. So, and also um, one thing here, the very simple rules uh, can get you very far in, in terms of that. Uh, it's possible potentially to use some form of machine learning, but I haven't seen a use case yet. Uh, okay, and that's it. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Marek, uh, and I represent Cloudflare. Uh, so I was asked to give a short talk on how we use uh, Linux uh, to build Cloudflare. Uh, in, if you haven't heard about Cloudflare, we are running a, a global network. Um, our servers sit between the users, uh, like, like they're browsing the internet, uh, and the actual uh, origins, the actual websites. Uh, our network is quite large. Uh, we are um, powering about 10% of internet domains. Uh, before we get any further, I would like to make an explicit um, distinction here. So we run two types of data centers. Uh, we run servers on the edge in multiple locations around the globe. 
um, these servers are used uh, to actually serve the data. But then we also have the core data centers, uh, which are used for offline processing, clock analysis, and things like that. In this talk, I will speak mostly about the Edge network. Uh, that's uh, my area of expertise. Okay, so our Edge network is quite large. Uh, our servers are in uh, about 170 locations around the world. Um, and the deployments uh, vary from very small uh, and very large. Um, what makes our network uh, unique is uh, the use of Anycast. Um, this helps us in a number of ways. So in Anycast basically, basically means that every data center um, advertises exactly the same IP ranges. Um, so a single IP address is kind of visible all around the world, even though it's not served from a single place. So this helped with uh, speed, uh, because uh, whenever you connect to our IP address, you are guaranteed to connect to the closest uh, server to your current location. And it also helps us with the um, denial of service attacks. Uh, if there's attack against a single IP address, it's nicely distributed all, all around the world. Um, on the software side, uh, we are uh, having quite a uniform configuration. Each and every server is almost identical on the software side. Uh, we don't do virtualization, we don't run containers, we run our software on, uh, on bare metal. Uh, every server has attached thousands and thousands of IP addresses to it. Uh, that's because we are using Anycast. Uh, and furthermore, we have a quite rich stack of applications. Uh, we are running a full stack of um, HTTP pipeline um, that does TLS termination, uh, HTTP2, quick. Uh, we also run um, a user's code, uh, which we call workers. So we are able to deploy uh, foreign code on our servers. Then we also have DNS applications. We are running quite a large DNS authoritative name server. Uh, we also have a resolver project. Uh, we also have a couple of smaller pieces, but the, uh, the message here is that we don't run a single piece of code. On hardware side, our servers are quite similar to each other. Um, this is a picture from our uh, blog post about Gen 9 servers. As you can see in single chassis, we have four different x86 machines. Um, they are very similar, they're identical, but they are like different separate boxes, so we can replace them if you want. Uh, the main intention here is to pack uh, as much capacity, as much CPU power in a unit as, as we can. Within a single data center, we usually run only a couple of generations of server, so you can generally assume that each and every server is quite the same uh, and they deliver a reasonably similar amount of, um, amount of uh, processing power. Uh, I need to note that we are running heavy experiments with using ARM servers. Um, there are strong reasons to use ARM. Uh, so we are porting our software stack to, 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 to use ARM. So if you've done any kernel work on uh, getting uh, Linux ready for ARM, thank you very much, we are definitely, definitely using that. Um, and this is one of the reasons why Linux is, is great. Uh, we probably wouldn't, able to be, wouldn't be able to pull it off if we used some other platform. Um, our stack, both software and hardware, is quite uniform, and that's, this allows us to think um, about traffic in data center, um, about servers in data centers are basically shared nothing. Um, we have, as pretty much everyone else, uh, north-south traffic, when north is requests from users, south is uh, requests going back to the actual content, to the, to the, um, to the origin servers, and then east-west traffic when the servers uh, exchange data between themselves. Um, for example, uh, a single cached file will be on a single, on a one machine, not on many machines. So if it's requested from another machine, uh, it, there, there needs to be um, quite large east-west traffic. Um, each and every server runs exactly the same software stack. Um, here I pointed uh, to five different kind of stages, which I'll go into more details in a moment. But it's, it's important to understand that uh, the servers are identical. So even though each of the, when the request crosses the layers, it may go to different server, each server runs, runs the full stack. Um, let me just go through quickly uh, on uh, how, do we, how do we actually, what do we do with the requests, uh, what is our application um, kind of pipeline. So first the request goes via, um, it's routed via ECMP, so kind of hardware load balancing, um, and it hits uh, XDP layer. Um, XDP layer uh, on Linux boxes does, we are using it for two things. Uh, first we are using it for DDoS mitigation, and then we are also using XDP for load balancing. Then load balancing forwards 
forwards traffic to potentially another machine uh, within the same data center, uh, and it hits normal Linux kernel, normal Linux uh, IP tables, and normal Linux networking stack, and it's routed to what we call a protocols layer. You can think about protocols layer as a place when we terminate TLS quick, um, things like that. From now on, uh, the request is piped over uh, Unix pipe, so kind of local host, to an application, to our application brain, uh, which we call Frontline. Um, it's an Nginx uh, installation with Lua code in inside. Uh, it's quite important to understand this is IO, sorry, this is CPU bound. Uh, this, this is a heavy Lua code where we do all the business logic. Uh, this business logic derives the cache key and the request is then routed uh, to potentially another machine in the same data center, uh, which actually can store the asset on disk. Um, and from now on, we usually return assets uh, from disks directly. If not, we have to reach back to the origin. Um, I mentioned that the uh, XDP layer, uh, we, we, are, um, we are doing these mitigations. Um, so um, we want to do that, we need to do that in front of our load balancer because we don't want to forward heavy DDoS traffic within our, our data center. Um, this, uh, this code is, uh, is not, uh, it's basically mostly dropping packets. Uh, if you want to hear more about what it does, uh, I think today, five o'clock, uh, my colleague uh, Arthur will speak about exactly that component. Uh, but the other things we can do in this layer is to rate limit inbound traffic. Um, this is uh, very nice and XDP is perfect place for it, uh, with the exception that XDP doesn't do uh, any memory synchronization barriers, uh, which makes uh, it tricky to write simple things like token buckets. So if you see any pull requests from us on uh, adding some locks, maybe spin locks, or, or doing maybe compare exchange uh, in the XDP, that's the reason. Basically, we need token buckets. And then on the normal networking, uh, networking side uh, of Linux kernel, we are running uh, DDoS mitigations in multiple layers. Uh, we are running uh, many modules on IP tables. Uh, we are running XTBPF, con limit, hash limits, IP sets. Uh, these are super useful for DDoS mitigations. If, there, if the packet goes through them, uh, we hit syn cookies. Uh, thanks for uh, fixing syn cookies in 3.18. Uh, before that, they were very slow. Um, and finally, the application themselves can set some filters using SL filter, so basically BPF on top of sockets. Uh, this is fairly useful. Okay, the next layer is uh, load balancing, uh, which we do in XDP. Um, I won't go into more details here, but I just want to flag that the load balancing layer needs to be able to do a socket lookup. It needs to be able, uh, the way we designed it is that it needs to be able to verify if the packet um, flying in can potentially belong to a connection that is uh, local to the, to, to the current machine. Uh, BPF, is, XDP has, uh, has uh, helpers for that, so it works quite well, but it's not really complete yet. For example, we needed to add a um, helper to um, decide if sim cookie is valid. Um, as for, as for a couple of weeks ago, that was not possible. So this is another area of XDP work we are engaged in. Okay. So then packets are routed to kind of normal Linux networking stack. Uh, it goes via IP tables, which I mentioned, and then we do socket dispatch. Uh, by socket dispatch, I mean basically to which socket the, the packet should be routed to inside Linux uh, networking stack. Um, you may say, okay, it's easy, you bind to port 80 and we are done. Uh, unfortunately, in our case, it is much, much more complex. Uh, I'll give you a couple of use cases why this is not trivial for us. So, um, for example, um, for uh, DDoS, uh, we decided uh, to not have a shared uh, UDP receive socket. Uh, the reason is that if there is an attack against a single IP address, uh, we don't want other IP addresses to suffer. So historically, we have about 30,000 uh, UDP sockets, uh, just in order to be sure that the queue that will overflow will not affect the others. Uh, nowadays, we can uh, fix that with uh, so filter and eBPF on sockets, so we are working towards that. Um, second problem, or second caveat maybe, um, about UDP sockets is it's pretty hard to do uh, zero downtown, downtime restarts. Um, with new work like Quick, it will become more and more painful. Uh, so we are doing a uh, hack when we do a four tuple kind of connected sockets on top of um, unconnected sockets, uh, but perhaps there is a better way. Maybe we can improve the APIs. And finally, as I mentioned, we have many, many, many IP addresses. We have thousands of IP addresses. And for us, it's not good enough uh, to just bind to port 80 for all the IPs. We may have different uh, uh, applications uh, needing to bind to port 80 on different IP ranges. 
Uh, just to give you one example, uh, our resolver is on a couple IP addresses, our authoritative name server is on a couple IP addresses. Uh, they, they, both of them are running on number of IP addresses, um, so we can't bind to specific slash 32s. Uh, so we need something else. Uh, for that, we prepared a patch called uh, so bind to prefix. Uh, we submitted it a couple of years ago. Um, this basically allows you to bind to a specific sub subnet. Um, it, 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 the reception wasn't very, uh, very uh, open. Um, uh, I think it's kind of specific to our use case, but still, there needs to be. I, we believe there needs to be some innovation uh, around this area. Uh, recently, we started using tproxy uh, when we have similar issue, uh, but not um, multiple sockets. But when we basically want a single socket to answer to traffic to multiple port uh, numbers. Uh, if you consider, um, uh, for example, catching traffic from all 65,000 port numbers, tproxy is the solution for that. Um, unfortunately, this, uh, this works reasonably for our current design, but it doesn't really work with the um, uh, load balancer, which I mentioned. As I mentioned, the load balancer needs to do the socket dispatch and is completely confused about the tproxy uh, IP tables firewall rule. Um, so once again, perhaps we can improve the socket dispatch uh, in Linux. Perhaps we can um, add the BPF around INET lookup or, or improve it some, some other way to make it more flexible. On next layer inside our uh, application stack, we are um, using a, a patch uh, from, uh, from JSON. Um, this is a fairly, early, fairly old patch uh, which uh, wasn't merged at the end. I think there was a lacking use case, but we have a use case for it. So the problem with in, in, in our design, or maybe in Linux, is that um, the frontline uh, part, uh, which, does, um, which does the CPU-intensive request processing, is using EPOL and it does accept on the Unix uh, socket. The, the problem is that EPOL really uh, doesn't load balance the accepted sockets. So we end up in a couple of workers doing plenty of work and most of the workers, most of the CPUs being idle. Uh, so basically there is no load balancing involved. So EPOL uh, round robin allows us to fix that. Uh, perhaps it could be useful for, also for others. And finally, looking to the future, we are very excited about doing uh, more, putting more, uh, pushing more da um, data plane onto the kernel. Uh, in multiple pl pl places, we have a need to just splice to TCP sockets. Uh, a good example is web sockets. Uh, uh, we really don't need to receive data from one end and just write it to the other end. We could just ask kernel to, to, to splice the sockets together and do the, all the work um, inside, uh, inside kernel. Uh, so SockMap could be used for that. SockMap is not really ready for prime time yet, but we are definitely looking into that. Similar, similarly, KTLS uh, uh, with send file is a very powerful tool which could speed up our um, cache, uh, cache uh, uh, serving data from disk. Um, we are uh, doing many experiments uh, to tune stuff for, for the internet, so we are very excited about the BPF SOCOPT um, and other developments. I want to mention one more thing, which is uh, the, uh, the problem of introspection um, on Linux. A, a static, a, a normal example is um, how, we, how we operate is our SREs have an alert on listen drops metric in netstat. This is a very useful metric. It tells you whether the new connections were dropped because the application was too slow. That's fine. So we want to know that. The problem is Linux doesn't tell you which application had a problem. So, it, uh, so currently it requires, it requires an operator to log into machine and verify what is, what is wrong. So th basically the granularity of Linux counters is not good enough for, for our use case. So the solution we are using is uh, eBPF Exporter. Uh, it's a Prometheus module, Prometheus backend, which allows us to run eBPF probes on our server fleet. And with, with that, we can extract pretty much anything we want. Uh, it is super useful for many, many things. We found multiple bugs with that. This is basically our way of introspecting kernel for specific needs we have. Um, a good example is um, uh, disk speed. If you want to have histograms, not just row counter, not, not just single counter, it can do that. Um, as always, upgrading the kernels is hard, especially with a large fleet. Uh, I don't think I have much to say here except for the fact that we hit a couple of uh, hardware bugs recently uh, and a couple of kernel regressions. I mean, there is the, the, the pain needs to be there. Uh, perhaps we can improve on, on, on how we roll out new changes. In case you didn't notice, I just mentioned to you six layers of VPFs inside our stack. And we're just starting. There are at least three more layers we can potentially use. So uh, it's not software eating the world, it's BPF eating the kernel, I guess. 
Um, I'm not sure if that's good or bad. On one hand, it's good because it's super powerful um, uh, and it really allows us to, to do very exciting things. On the other hand, it's kind of scary that we stop developing kernel APIs. Uh, perhaps we can, we can improve. Thank you very much. So, one question that I had when I talked to you folks in the hallway, each of you said you use Linux in a different way. Some of you are heavily invested in kernel bypass, some of you are not. So, I was wondering if you can talk about why you choose these things, what are the goals, what motivates you to go through kernel bypass or not, what you would like to see in the Linux kernel that will make your goals easier to achieve. I know Mark talked about it a little bit, but maybe the other two, if you can talk about that. Um, thanks, uh, Sumini. Um, so we are not uh, really contributing at this stage to kernel, but what we look at is a strategic investment into kernel because what happens is this is the common denominator across the world where we could go and program certain things, whether it's routing, whether it's something related to um, slicing. I, I, what we are looking at as a kernel is a resource, and I think there are, I, Cloudflare is heavily invested, as we can see, um, in the way they run their infrastructure. Um, for us, most of the features like XCP sounds pretty interesting. EBWeb program programmability is what we look for. Um, these technologies we'll use. Um, so f the, there's a certain issues with how, um, how it's not that easy to use kernel. Uh, we either develop a team for kernel developers in-house, so, or we basically rely on outsourcing that to someone. So that's the challenge we basically struggle with, but essentially, um, if you look at the way technologies are improving, um, thanks to some of the work uh, the contributors here who have done, um, I think it's uh, getting ready for the next generation of internet, what we believe should be. Um, low latency, uh, slicing, and all these programmability features, I think they'll evolve pretty fast. Um, and everybody will use it. Um, I saw in uh, Arthur's presentation, you also talked about programmability in your data center, so um, it sounds pretty exciting that you guys are working on it. But that's, that's how I think. Yeah, um, so uh, my perspective is slightly different here as, uh, as we do not use Linux in a way that uh, the guys at the edge are using. Um, so I do want to focus at the um, at the application itself. So the way I look at it is more broadly as um, Linux as the kernel or Linux as the entire system or, or even community enables us to do the things we do uh, with, the, with the networking. Um, but also having that said, um, LinkedIn and uh, the, a lot of large scale operators, um, they have a luxury of not using this um, general paradigm of the network where uh, people, it's assumed that people own only network. Uh, all these companies, they own um, the infrastructure end to end. So he's starting from the end hosts, going here through the network and ending at the end host. Um, so the, the good part is, so we are uh, looking very closely at the, at the advances in things like TCP analytics. Uh, where we can use the, the state held at the end host to, um, to have better network observability or to, uh, to measure or to, to better understand how, uh, how the applications perceive or how they experience the network. So uh, about the kernel bypass, uh, we were we were using a uh, proprietary kernel like bypass for DDoS with a simple uh, argument that if you need to drop millions of packets per second, it's much more efficient to do it in the bypass case. Uh, but unfortunately, w that's about it. We don't have an, an other use case. Um, there are people suggesting to use uh, kernel bypass for speeding up uh, TCP and Linux kernel. Uh, there are a couple of problems with that. First is that uh, the multi-tenancy story is quite hard, so we don't run a single application. If we run a single piece of code, 
perhaps we could offload it, uh, but we have multiple pieces. Second is that tooling is quite hard. Uh, we do use things like TCP dump, which generally don't work with, uh, with the offload solutions. Um, and finally, our application is mostly CPU bound. Uh, we don't spend too much time in doing actually, um, uh, actually interrupts and actually doing, spending time in networking stack. So, so it's, it's always hard for me to, 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 to judge what is the goal of kernel bypass. If the goal is for beta latency, perhaps that's a, that's a valid use case. Uh, but but it, but you have but, but but you pay cost in in flexibility. So one of the biggest challenges, um, and it's pretty well known, with things like the kernel is upgrades. Um, it's true for all software that upgrading is always a pain, but kernels in particular seem really problematic in upgrading to the extent that. Um, there are certainly some people who are just terrified of this. I'm, I'm wondering, from the perspective of the major operators, um, what, what is the state of this and where do you think this could go to improve this process? So obviously, if we're not upgrading kernels, um, even with programmability and XDP, uh, there's still going to be things we can do. So um, do you have any comments on that? So from our point of view, uh, we have a luxury of not storing too much state on our edge servers. So in the worst case, we can always turn off a data center, do the reboots, do, do whatever we need for on, on the maintenance window, and then turn it on back again. So it's, it's, it's generally fine. I think the tendency to move more and more things to BPF is a partial solution, solution for that. Uh, XDP allows us to not write kernel modules, which is a good thing. Um, but I don't think there is a there is a broader story. The one of, n n another issue we are running into uh, is uh, kernel driver bugs. Uh, so it is beneficial for us to run older kernel versions where when we are sure that that is it's less buggy. Uh, but I think the risk is always there. So I don't think there's a, there's a solution. Did you oh. have a yeah. Uh, okay. Sure. Um, so. Mm. I think a very a similar key challenges apply to uh, upgrading the kernel on, on the network devices. Okay, let's say the access key switch that many of the machines are connected to. Um, so, so here I, I see this more as a shared game between the, the network and the application. So if the, the applications are designed in a way that are stateless or uh, it's kind of a easy to, to migrate away uh, all the key traffic from the servers connected to the, uh, the switch, then the, this whole upgrade is getting, let's say, easier. Uh, I'm not saying easy, but uh, at least easier. Um, but to... to um, and obviously, there is no one, one good solution for that. There are key solutions that are um, you probably they have higher chances of introducing fewer outages, uh, like uh, the rolling upgrades, doing canaries, uh, progressive rollouts, or automatic uh, automatic validations if uh, if the device after the upgrade works correctly or not, and then rolling back rolling back automatically. I think that's a huge problem. Yeah, upgrade kernel. Um, I think right now people are looking at this problem as a data center problem. Can I isolate certain machines and upgrade them and then um, um, then upgrade the rest zone or the clusters? But I think the way if Net Linux has to mature to be the end device kernel, I think um, somebody who solves this problem will be a multi-billion dollar company um, because um, I, I think this is not an e easy problem today. Every time you touch kernel, I think it's a hassle. The people roll back, people uh, lose connectivity, and it, and more and more so, I think um, people are actually very slow in moving to latest kernel version just because of the fear of um, these things happening in the network today. Um, but yeah, uh, it's a real problem in the kernel today. I think that'll be awesome if somebody could fix it. Yeah, but if you if you rely on a distro vendor, I guess the distro vendor will take care of you. 
I mean, oh, I, that's true. And yeah. most of the times we see that we have to tell them this version we need, but the operators are not, um, you know, that skilled to debug the problem in real time. So yeah, some, some solution exists that we could actually look at what's going on uh, with upgrade, what's wrong, and then, then why are we losing connectivity or why the machine is not coming up. I think this kind of visibility, if we can get throughout the infrastructure, not just actually the, fab, the, the cloudless we're building, but uh, when we upgrade the devices out in the field, that would be awesome. Okay. So both of you talked about programmable, need for programmability. Are you guys looking at programmable hardware and better support for these hardware in Linux or like P4 or something, or it's just at software level? Um, uh, no, I, I, no, I don't think, uh, we don't see that adoption that fast. Okay. What we are seeing is that a um, lot of operators are buying general hardware um, it's just a cost of buying this in bulk and deploying it and virtualizing whole of their VNF uh, and core networks. I think the drive there is to squeeze the maximum bang for the buck, whether I'm using a standard make or whether can I do something in the kernel or can I upload to the hardware. That's the drive we see. We do not see um, people jumping on programmability that much on the hardware side, but for for us to bring this to life, to Edge, uh, we have to scale this in a way that we could program instructions in the kernel, starting very simply there, um, then actually move those uh, systems, subsystems which we have want to offload into the generic hardware. I think the technology is there. I think that's the stage we are looking at this problem, not really, okay. not trying to solve by building some custom chips or hardware, no. Okay. Uh, okay, so he, to me, it's it's much more important that he programmability at the software level than uh, at the hardware level. As the the whole goal is to to keep the uh, his data plane as simple as possible. So at um, at every every single time we can replace the chip, we can replace the vendor, and. Um, at the same time, I I just think that the the biggest value of, of building great networks lies more on the management plane here than actually on the, on the here data plane. So while obviously I'm I'm watching this very closely and it's very fascinating to see things like P4 and um, and here programmable hardware and I believe the the real use case are still to emerge. Uh, but as, as of now, we decided to, keep, to go the way of keeping the, the network as, as soon as possible and he tried to, to move uh, a lot of complexity due to the applications. Okay. So before the XDP was uh, created, uh, there was a need to offload more stuff, either to do kernel bypass or offload it to the hardware. Uh, but nowadays XDP is just fast enough, uh, so I don't see uh, us pressing our vendors to do more hardware uh, offloads. Um, having said that, there are two things which uh, I'm personally very excited about. One is just the good old TCP uh, offloads. Can someone get LRO working uh, well, please, for many flows these days? Um, and the second one is uh, magical XDP uh, offloads. We are running XDP code, we don't mind where it runs. Uh, as long as we own it and as long as we can uh, modify it rapidly, I don't mind it running on, on a hardware NIC. Okay. So I, I have a follow-up question directed to Arthur, I guess. I'm told to ask hard questions, so. <laughs> so I guess, um, as you know, we've been talking about hardware offload and you've you just mentioned simpler data planes. And we have been talking about, uh, in the hardware offload workshops, about uh, for ASICs, switch ASICs especially, offloading the kernel data plane to hardware using native uh, Linux acceleration. So have you, and I know Sonic doesn't do that. It is kind of a kernel bypass. So have you guys spent any time looking at what the kernel is doing? Um. So, um, it works, I guess. Um, so, 
I personally think there's much more of a use case at the at the edge side of things. I I mentioned about this uh, east west explosion. So the the amount of the traffic in the data center is much much bigger, and actually it, it's not uh, about being you know, religious here. We simply go with the uh, solution that works well for us is is good enough and uh, taking into account the environment we are in. So uh, our um, our resources and our constraints. Um, so simply as of now, if you're looking from the sonic perspective or if you're looking from the, the perspective of the switches in the data center, we simply have no use case for it. Okay. And for the routing stack, do you guys use FRR or? Oh yeah, yeah. so I believe it's, uh, it's uh, FRR and it's a simple BGP here, so you cannot think very magical. So Does anyone have questions in the audience? I, I still have to respond, I, yeah. but yes. if you don't want me to hear me, <laughs> no, it's okay. I I can was, uh, I, no. no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, um, I, on the contrary, I think, um, as Arthur said, we definitely want to avoid the east-west traffic. Okay. Uh, we don't believe that's the way we could actually run any latency sensitive application. We're gonna program TOR. We're gonna try to do load balancing on the TOR to hit the right container. Um, these are the environments where people are looking for stringent things. Um, highly likely there'll be live critical applications on it. So we, we definitely won't be doing uh, east-west explosions as microservices are evolved. Um, we will try to contain that in a very lightweight format and try to program top of racks, which is um, the fastest way we could get the packet out, the best we could serve the customers. Okay. I think we get to the public now? Yeah. The chair is fast. Okay. So I'm just curious. Um, most of, most of the workloads you run are kind of in-house. Um, I'm just curious, lots of uh, ink has been spilled about uh, all, of the, um, uh, all of the side channels uh, that exist in current hardware and lots of CPU cycles are, for some people are spent on, on trying to mitigate this. Um, are all of you kind of disabling these um, mitigations? because you're just running your own code, or um, uh, are, are you affected in any way uh, by this, and what, you know, working on reducing the performance impact of these mitigations be of interest to I, I can answer that from Calter point of view. Uh, we have mostly uh, software stack written by us, so it's most not a problem. But we do run workers, which which is basically a third party uh, user user uh, supplied code. Uh, so we do our best to run all the uh, mitigations. Um, in case of Linux, uh, the response to the to the hardware bugs was quite quite excellent. Uh, but it wasn't without problems. We have a couple of crashes and we have a couple of issues. But we are we are doing our best. Um, better question is uh, how it. What, it, what are the implications to the APIs? Uh, and definitely in our case, uh, our JavaScript APIs are being trimmed in order to not leave uh, too much attack surface. So at least we are considering that. Um, yeah, so in, uh, in our perspective, I believe it's slightly simpler as the uh, Sonic switches are totally internal with, uh, with no way of accessing them from inside or the uh, switches accessing outside. Uh, plus, all the, all the software is either open source or written by us. Uh, so, I guess we should be good on that front. Um, we aren't doing anything right now. We're just running Kube cluster on bare metal server right now. Uh, nothing special. I had a question on network analytics. I know, I think, Arthur, you mentioned that uh, telemetry. Um, and we did have a couple of analytics workshops and so on at the conference. Do you guys have any specific uh, requirements or specific uh, 
things that you use today from the kernel stack? Yeah, uh, so the, the main challenge, I guess, with the, is with the sheer amount of data and keep processing it and collecting it. So um, while we have all the, all the basics that needs to be collected in TCP info, uh, that, that should be more than enough, uh, um, the, the things we have now, the challenge is connecting this at scale uh, or if you're collecting at scale, then saving this and, and making them available, uh, both, uh, both for the, the real-time uh, analytics. So, if you, for example, deciding whether uh, if someone says the network is slow, uh, whether uh, it is really the network or maybe it's a, a, um, it's a host or a NIC or, uh, or the application. Um, so, and... Um, it's it's also important to to perform the TCP analytics or any form of analytics as close to the, the user as possible. As uh, the fundamental question is, where does the network start? So um, he sometimes uh, he networking people think more about the first access port on a switch, but the, what what user thinks that the network for for them is between two sockets, and they he do not care what fails. Uh, so, assuming we can we can measure some form of uh, metrics uh, or some form of user satisfaction with the network, as close to the the socket level uh, as possible, or as close to the application level uh, as possible, that open, that also allows us to um, to spend our time and and resources on activities that actually improve the things that are broken. So that's an interesting comment, right? Uh, I was I would have thought that for you to do your telemetry at the edge where the socket lives is not as interesting as doing something like Excite where you have all this data on Kafka or something and you mine it and try to find out what parts of the network were underperforming. Is that not true? It's not intuitive to me. Yeah, um, okay, so I'm not involved in the edge, so uh, okay, that's why I... Uh, I am not um, I am not the the right person to uh, he discuss the edge, but uh, he still even having Kafka uh, he with the thousands of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands sometimes connections per host. Uh, he trying to export all the data, probably it, it wouldn't work. So sure, now we need to be much much more selective and do some form of sampling or. Uh, exporting only the interesting events. Sure, there's a large volume of data, but I would have thought that for you to um, monitor these things at the socket may even be impossible if the socket is inside a virtual machine or something, for example. Right? So you would have to get it from outside the VM and monitor it. Oh, uh, so we have uh, bare metal servers, so uh, we don't have to deal with, with VMs. I see. Okay, One other gonna... question I had when you when I saw slides was you said that you have a flat network, so you don't have to deal with multi tenancy for that reason as well. Um, okay, so um, yeah, uh, okay, flat network uh, it it's a result of the of the simplicity in the design. So we want to to keep the network as uh, as simple as possible. And if any any team any application they they want to build build their own overlay. It's fine, but uh, the the network organization or network team uh, as a whole is is not offering that that kind of things. I see. Uh, probably one or question or more or two maybe. Okay, while you're passing the mic, I'll ask a mobile Ajax guy. <coughs> did you just did, did I hear you correctly saying you you don't care about the hype called Kubernetes, or no, we do. We, okay. we do. Uh, you have to understand the Kubernetes uh, genesis is that um, Google is promoting it and people like it, right? So we're not gonna say no to it. Right. But does it serve the purpose of performance? I think the audience here understand the technology very well. It doesn't, right? It's meant for usability. Ninety percent of the users and cloud service providers don't really care what black, black magic is happening underneath. Um, but in these latency sensitive environments, we would care, 
Um, so we'll have to change certain key things in that orchestration scheme to allow us to program that stuff, right? Um, so no, we, we do care. Okay, but you, you, the, you also care about, uh, you say, I think performance is important to you and you don't think Kubernetes is ready in that space? Um, Kubernetes allows you flexibility. You can plug in whatever you want there. Uh, what we are seeing is that we don't see that typically that people would change that. They tend to just onboard an application on a cloud, um, whatever default is available, they use it. Um, but when we offer a service like that, which is a little sensitive, we'll have to take care of the, the way we plumb the packets into the containers which are running the back. So please go ahead. So um, there were many comments about how latency is important. I was hoping you can help put a number to both what kinds of latencies are expected, like what you have now and where you're going, and also what throughput you're looking at. Um, okay, I'll start. Um, we care only for end-to-end -end latency. Um, that's the only metrics we believe is the right metrics. Um, we start off by taking care of our own infrastructure first, uh, the things we can control. Um, but then there's other aspects of run latency which we haven't figured out the right ways to do it as of now. But we are working with some partners to uh, evolve that space. So you could actually have contracts on the RAN side to say, yeah, I'm going to give you a latency um, optimal slice, and you can actually run latency sensitive applications in there. But um, it is with respect to technology, um, I think the shortest path is if you short circuit a packet out of the hardware itself. Right, I mean, uh, that would be the ideal way to do it. It's probably a low cost way too. Um, but yeah, there are certain applications which we w might short circuit that way, but there are other applications which actually might go to user space. So there are different aspects or different types of workloads. Uh, depends on where these applications are situated, what kind of stuff they're running. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all over the place. But we only care about the end-to-end -end latency. Um, if we can improve it, uh, that is awesome. Today when we see tra traffic coming from client device to internet, um, we in all operators we see more than uh, 40 millisecond delays. And that's the ba benchmark we have. Once we bring the, the cloud light inside the operator, it drops significantly to 20, 25 milliseconds. Uh, so that's good enough to run certain applications, but we need to do better than that. Um, the multiple questions. The what was your question again? I, I didn't hear the delay you mentioned when the cloud light is outside the interface. Um, you mean after the on the public cloud? Yeah. Yeah. So it varies greatly depending on the region, and also the forty millisecond I'm actually measuring is from a client device to the internet router before it aggresses to internet exchange point. Um, yeah. It, the minimum is 40 milliseconds or so. Unless somebody has a, adopted a breakout strategy and then also it doesn't, yeah. So most of the traffic we serve is HTTP. Um, so the latency is mostly uh, incurred by the network. Uh, we try to run our data centers, let's say within 10 milliseconds to everyone. It is possible and fairly easy in certain regions like Europe or, or US. It's very hard to do it in Philippines when it runs on wireless over multiple links. So it depends on the region, uh, the specific guarantees you want. Uh, but this also ties back to the kind of technical discussion on kernel bypass. Uh, if I can speed up the kernel packet processing time by 50 micros, that's great. It, it, the user will not notice that at all. Um, I had asked a second question about what throughput is required in the context of the latency and would you be able to comment on that? Uh, the, the best throughput you can guess. Pick a number. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are able to saturate our, our machines with this. Are you asking about the user expectations or? No, I'm asking about the network capacity expectations. Oh, uh, 
we are serving plenty of data. We are, we, we, like, each server is fairly busy and is sending gigabytes or gigabits. We historically run on, uh, each server was capped to 10 gigs because that's, that's the link we were having. We are not usually going up to 10 gigs, but it depends on the patterns. It, if, it depends on the traffic per power. So it can go quite high. But you, you usually should, should, uh, should expect a couple of gigs uh, per server. Thanks. All right, I think we will probably stop here. Uh, I would like to ask, how do you troubleshoot the XDP programs? I mean, since you're in a driver space and not in a kernel space, so you don't have a, a typical uh, utilities that you do with a kernel. I'm not an XDP expert, but uh, today, 5 o'clock, my colleague will tell you exactly that. Okay. A high level question. Uh, so with the, with the advance of uh, the internet services and clouds and everything, uh, privacy started to be a concern. And Linux was built, and the whole open source movement was built around freedoms and privacy and all that stuff. With like some of the presentation here being about uh, fetching accuracy, fetching precise location of people with with an accuracy that was literally not really needed for the service, and uh, actually fighting active users uh, that try to protect their privacy by hitting their location. So my question is, how can we as the Linux community help you to protect or care about the privacy of your users more? A very that's, succinct that's answer, really like quick. Uh, this one I'm actually gonna let have. Okay, um, go ahead. Okay, so the problem, what you saw, what we were doing with the location verification is a common problem. Um, it's not something that uh, we have any access to what your number is or what content you're viewing. That's not the idea of it. Um, when you actually connect your device to mobile network, by very nature of connecting that, they have to provide you a service on a tower. They need to have that information. They do not expose us any of your location credentials. There is a sophisticated mechanism that a token is exchanged which is completely opaque to us who the cu customer is. The only thing which is happening is if somebody has a leakage in their business model and people are actually um, exploiting it, you could avoid that by saying, yes, this person, and this is no person, by the way. This, is, this token is somewhere in this location. That's all it is, really. So there's no privacy encroachment per se here. We don't know uh, who the user is. We just know the applications we offload. And most of the times, even the application content is encrypted. Um, so what you're seeing in the way we are laying out our infrastructure uh, it's actually like load, layer four load balancing. It's not like typical layer seven stuff. We don't we don't see any content. Speed it up, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when when uh, the panelists want to respond to that, others. No I more don't questions. Think anybody please. is looking at the data, right? Except right. Google. Right. Uh, uh, you're the mobile, the edge guy. Yes. Oh, okay. So, uh, no more questions, please. Take it outside. These guys are about. Now, what we'll do next time is maybe we should make this two hours. It's, uh, we, this was an experiment. We'll try to bring uh, uh, different types of industries here They'll s uh, and talk about did, did people like this uh, kind of panel? Yeah. Send, yeah? Well, send us an email if you don't like it, because otherwise we're going to assume you like it, right? <laughs> or talk. No huh? What's that? So no more questions. Okay, no more questions. Okay. Let's give it up for the panelists. Thanks.